Well, tonight we're in Philemon. We're in Philemon. So right before the right before the end of your Bible, you've forgotten Philemon. Oftentimes forgotten. And looking forward to being there this evening. I am um, very, very thankful. And I still have my voice today. It's the best it's been in a week. And so you may think I'm a little bit raspy tonight, but I'm actually really thankful that I'm still able to speak at this stage. And uh, I don't have Philemon. Uh, it should be after Timothy and Titus, but uh, there it is. All right, there it is. Right after Titus, Philemon, and uh, chapter 3. Well, it's just like 2 Corinthians 15. You know, same thing. <laughs> I want to preach an encouraging message this evening that I hope. Uh, this is actually one uh, in, in a part of a series we're in in Miami Beach. But, you know, sometimes, sometimes you preach a message, and they might be good messages. Uh, you don't really know as far as the overall, you know, effect on a church goes when you preach a message because all you know about it is that it really got you or really used it for you. This is one of those that minister. I mean, sometimes you preach a message, and God just, it just seems like He's just bringing it up over and over again. Uh, during the week, and has in your mind your thoughts, and this would be one of those. Uh, I suppose I had a list of uh, messages of just key truths that are just really, really practical for us. This is one of those, and so I'd like to read tonight uh, verses one through seven of Philemon. And I, I don't, I, I can't really promise you that we'll finish uh, preaching through Philemon. I really, just want to preach this one message in particular, and I trust it'll be a help for us tonight. Paul a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our brother, unto Philemon, our dearly beloved and fellow laborer, and to our beloved uh, Phea and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in thy house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> I thank my God, making mention of thee always in my prayers, hearing of thy love and faith which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. For we have great joy and consolation in thy love because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee. Brother. Let's go back to verse 4 and read it one more time. I thank my God, making mention of thee always in my prayers, comma, and now we'll pray. Father, thank you so much for this letter, which is really such a great help that you saw fit to inspire it and have it be part of your eternal work. So we do not take lightly its inclusion. We do not believe it's incidental. And this great truth that really was for an individual, yet Father is for us. And I pray that we would be able to glean from it things that we could learn tonight, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, when you read the introduction of Paul's letter to his dear friend and brother Philemon, you are left with a strong impression of Philemon as an individual, aren't you? Now you say, Pastor, Philemon was a scoundrel. He was a slaveholder. And he was, uh, you know, he had had this argument with Onesimus. And also, we know, we know the material that's in, that's in Philemon. We understand and, and we know that. Uh, but let's, let's just look at what Paul wrote and let's look at what the Scripture had to say here because it's actually really a help. First of all, there are a couple things about this letter that set it apart, make it very, very distinct from all the other epistles. Philemon is addressed along with uh, a couple other individuals, Aphia and Archippus. And those, those are guys that are seldom mentioned in the Scripture, but it's really a letter... It's written to three people and the church that's in their house. It's not a pastoral epistle, however. This isn't really pastoral material that's in it. For instance, when Paul wrote the letter to Titus, he really wrote to him about pastoring, didn't he? And when Paul wrote the letter to Timothy, the same. Uh, those letters were very, very distinctly to those individuals, but really uh, they were so doctrinal, uh, really uh, establishing a lot of things about the function of the church. The form of the church is really established in the Acts, but the function of the church 
uh, is really, really laid down in Timothy and Titus. And so a lot of those things are uh, <clears throat> we're, we're helped by in the pastoral epistles, but Philemon is different. Philemon's a personal letter. Really, Archippus and, uh, and uh, our fellow, the other fellow, uh, Aphia, they're mentioned, but they're not addressed in the letter. Philemon is the one who is addressed in the letter. And so, now, we see a couple of things, first of all. We see the relationship that Paul and, and Timothy had with Philemon. They called him dearly beloved, in verse 1, and fellow laborer. Philemon's not an outsider. He's not an individual who is considered to be okay for the ministry or problematic in the ministry. He is an individual who is a dear, beloved brother. He's not a guy who's casually involved in serving God. You ever had a church in your house? You all have a church in your house, right? You ever had a church in your house? I have some. We have some dear friends uh, that have started churches in their homes. Many, actually, and I'm thinking in particular, particularly of a family uh, that started a church in their, or really just opened up a church. They didn't start the church, but they opened their house up for a church to start. And I'm just thinking about their preparations on Sunday morning. I mean, literally, they're up at 6 o'clock. They've got a barn. They've got a garage. They use their living room. They use their upstairs, their downstairs. Like, their whole house is used for, you know, now it's only on Wednesday nights, but initially, like, 100 people will come to their house and, and just have the run of the place. And, you know, they always, every Sunday, would have lunch for certain people. So not only would they, you know, open their house up and have to prepare everything, set everything up so it's a church instead of a house, but to do that. And uh, this is not just uh, Philemon's reference to, you know, your family, you know, that goes to your, to your homes. Don't mess with them, Sophia. No, I'm not. All right. So okay. Exactly All right. You leave him alone. All right. <laughs> He's learning how to behave in church. Okay. No <laughs> All right. So, um, I, I just saw that look. I'm like, she's up to it. I know it. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, now, so, Philemon is not casually involved in serving the Lord. Could we agree on that? In other words, the guys that he's aligned with, are they're all out. Timothy, the guy's all out. I mean, he's all in. He's 100%. He, nothing but the ministry. I mean, literally just left his home and his family and everybody just went and served wherever really got put for a long time at Ephesus. But he was an all-in guy. And Paul and Timothy are saying, fellow laborer. In other words, a guy that does the same things we do is the reference there. And that's a real compliment, actually, if you're being called a fellow laborer by an individual like Paul, along with Timothy. Think about that. Can you imagine uh, the Apostle Paul calling you or I a fellow laborer? We are, but I mean, that would be, you know, that would be quite a compliment with, when it comes to, you know, if you're saying Paul, Timothy, Ryan, <laughs> I don't, you know, I just kind of feel like these guys... They're real servants of the Lord. And so Paul, Timothy, Philemon, and uh, the other two fellas, Archippus and, and uh, that other guy, I keep forgetting his name. <laughs> uh, so that's a compliment. Um, they're told and they're wished well. Uh, he said in verse, <coughs> excuse me, in verse... Uh, Five, he said, hearing of thy love and faith, which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and toward all saints. He's a man of some reputation. And his reputation is that he's a loving guy and he's a faithful guy. Again, are there higher compliments for a servant of the Lord? I've heard of your love. And I've heard of your faith. could answer the question. Are there higher compliments for a servant of the Lord? I've heard of your love. I've heard of your faith. If you're going to write a letter of commendation to someone that was meaningful, and I mean not, not something you're going to come up with something nice to say, but I mean if, if these were commendations for someone, 
How would you like them to be your pastor or to be somebody that ministered to you or somebody that you served with? I mean, these are the kind of folks I'd like for members at Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church. People with legendary love and legendary faith. That is, they're heard of because of the way they love the Lord and they love others and the way that they uh, just trust God. And, you know, faith is always an example, isn't it? It's wonderful to have people that just believe God. It's just really nothing that pleases God more than people that exercise their faith. And so Philemon is really uh, to be commended here. Is he not? Yes. Pastor, he's a slaveholder. And he had it out with uh, Onesimus. Yeah, I know about that. Paul said, I pray for you pretty much every day. I don't know about you, but uh, it, it, if Paul, assuming he's telling the truth, I don't think Paul was a liar to you. If Paul said, I pray for you always, I'm always praying for you, Philemon, how would you feel if the Apostle Paul said, I pray for you all the time? I, I mean, I, there's some people that pray for me. There are a few people that pray for me daily. Now, I just want to tell you something. That means more to me than I can describe. That just that individuals go to the Lord and mention me on their behalf. I believe that God has provided for me and has protected me because of the prayers of individuals that pray for me. And I just, I believe that. It's, it's affected my life, the prayers of saints on my behalf. Paul said, I pray, I'm always praying for you. To Philemon. Now, he must have been a dear friend to Paul. You think Paul had a lot of people he could pray for? You think he could pray for everybody? There's not enough time in the day. All the people that Paul had come into contact with had influence and it were really his children in the faith. He didn't have time to pray for everybody. And he prayed. He said, I'm always praying for you, Philemon. And that's impressive to me. That gets my attention, does it you? I mean, it's just wow. Okay, this guy Philemon, some friend. And then he feeds him a compliment sandwich. You know what that is, right? Mm -hmm. Compliment, correction, compliment. Right? And so Paul feeds him a compliment sandwich. He says what he prays for. Here. He said what I pray for is that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. Let's read it again. That the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. I am praying for you that your faith, the that the communication of your faith would become effective in every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. How effective do you suppose, based on our context, was Philemon's faith? He was legendary. Right? Paul had heard about his faith and his love. So he's effective enough that people are hearing about it. Now think about that. Ponder that for a second. Meditate on that, will you? His faith is enough of an example that he's spoken of. Yet when Paul said, I'm always praying for you, I'm praying that your faith can become effectual. And then he mentions specifically, the language is not a mistake, every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. In other words, he said, Philemon, like everybody, there's room for improvement in your life. Would you say Philemon was effective? A church in his house, you think no one was affected by that? You think Philemon was effective? Uh, how, how do you suppose Onesimus came into contact with Paul? He was just happening through the prison in Rome and like, met Paul and then it turns out, oh, I know Philemon, you do too? No, I think, I think Onesimus knew who Paul was because Philemon knew Paul and was his friend. And it seems that when Onesimus came to a place when God was really dealing with him, 
that Paul was the guy he went to, but that was because of because of Philemon, I believe. Think about it. How would he have known? Well, because of Philemon. Listen to me, Christian. Wait for a second. Correction is not really ever negative. Proverbs 3, Solomon says, My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary when thou art corrected of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, even as a father the son, in whom he delighteth. And the Scripture quotes that in several other places. Because it's a great truth. And yet, one of the greatest hindrances to a believer who's even serving the Lord and God is using, could we say, to a legend degree or at least to a degree where they're famous spoken of. Oftentimes we see correction as something that's negative. As though when God corrects us, He's saying you're no good. Nothing you've done is worth anything. Nothing you do, everything you do, you know the nothings and the everythings, Everything you do is bad. Nothing you do is good. And that isn't the case at all. Paul said, Philemon, you're effective in the ministry, but I'm praying that you'll be completely effective. That you'll be effective in every good thing that's in you in Christ Jesus. What's God's expectation in your life? I love Romans 8. For whom He did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of His Son. If God's Spirit lives in you and He's the indwelling Christ in us, God's expectation for us is Jesus. Like Jesus. And Paul said, Onesimus, not Onesimus, Philemon, you're a good Christian. You're an encouragement. You're effective. You've got a great reputation. And I love you. You're my brother. You're my fellow laborer. You're profitable. And I'm just praying that you'll be complete. Everything that God wants you to be in Jesus Christ. And we're going to see kind of a major issue. We won't see it, but if you read in Philemon, you see a major issue he had in outing and out. And maybe it was Onesimus that was primarily to fault. But Paul is urging with authority Philemon to forgive Onesimus. There's something in his life that isn't everything it ought to be. And Paul said, Philemon, there's, there's room. There's room for growth. There's room for improvement. Effective. Effectual. Effectual. You ever look at that word? You ever look at it carefully? You know, my burden for our ministry is to do things that are meaningful. For our ministry to be meaningful. In other words, we don't have uh, we don't have kids program. We don't have we're on the bus, uh, so that parents have a place to send their kids. We're trying to reach kids' hearts for Jesus and reach the parents with our kids program. That's why we run the buses and pick kids up. We don't have a Sunday school hour because people get kind of bored between breakfast and worship time in our church. We have a Sunday school hour because we're trying to teach people to grow in their faith and know more about the Word of God. We don't have youth group because teenagers need to have something fun on Saturday nights. We're trying to reach teenagers for Jesus Christ and affect change in their lives. And so it's meaningful. We won't hold revival services or have guest speakers come in because they need bookings so that they don't have dead spots in their calendar. We want God to use them. We want them to use them with us. Understand what I'm saying? In other words, in the ministry, we want things to be done on purpose. We don't have a three-on-three -three basketball tournament because we like to play basketball. We want lost kids to come and to hear the gospel. And it's just a tool. It's a mechanism. 
in our ministry, we want to be effective. Individually, we want to be effective, do we not? To say to a person you could be more effective is not to say you're having no effect, is it? It's to simply say in Jesus Christ you have more potential to be realized. And man, that's a help to me. It's a help to me. How do we apply this? Well, this is, this is me personally. I get to preach a lot. Quite a bit. Uh, Sundays, a lot. During the week, quite a bit. Like this week, I'm going to be preaching one, two, three times on Tuesday. And then I'll be preaching Wednesday. I'll be preaching Thursday. I'll be preaching Saturday. And I'll be preaching again next Sunday. You know, all the times that I preach in a Sunday, I get to preach a lot. It's a real privilege. Sometimes I get to sit and hear preaching. Actually, I won't be preaching Wednesday this week. I was, I was wrong about that. Uh, Brother Washer will be preaching Wednesday. When I get to sit in preaching, before I have the opportunity to do that, a lot of times that's just to me is just such an opportunity. I just really look forward to it. One of the reasons I enjoy my vacation is I like to go to churches and just say, you know, God, let's, let, let's, let me have it. I want to hear it. And just say, God, you know, here we are. It's a checkup. And you can, you know, you can uh, go ahead and go ahead and let me have it. <laughs> go ahead and tell me what's wrong in my life or areas where I need to grow or whatever. And when God does that, He isn't saying, you know, you're good for nothing. Is He? What's He saying? Effectual. Why don't you be effectual? Where's error? Maximum potential. Got to use everything that you have. I look at a guy like Philemon, and I just think, man, with all Paul and Timothy had to say about this guy, <laughs> where's there even room for improvement? Well, there was. And that's true for us as well. How are you when it comes to God teaching you? Or God correcting you? God working in your life? How do you respond? you take it as God says I'm no good? Or do you take it as God says in Jesus Christ I can be more? Isn't that great? Isn't it wonderful that with everything going on in Philemon's life that Paul said I pray for you every day so that you can do more for Jesus. For Jesus. Christ which is in you. And I just, to me, that's profound. Because it really helps me when I'm corrected to be able to receive it and be able to apply it and be able to use it in my life so I can take the next step forward. Not many Christians, not many believers can be corrected. It's too bad, isn't it? There's a lot of room for growth in everyone. Thank God for this letter. And I think that if you're going to pull a theme from Philemon and ask the question, why is this in the canon of the Scripture? Why is it a personal matter between a man and his slave in the Scripture? It's an example for us. To see how someone who was a great man, had a great reputation, who really was one of the elite, ministers of God, if you want to put it that way, had room to grow. And that's an example for us. Father, thank You for this example. I pray that You would help us be able to practice it practically speaking. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You're out of here.